Well, thanks very much, Rick, for that introduction. It's always risky when someone introduces you in a really beautiful, flowery way, because then you have a lot to live up to. So I'll do my best tonight. Um, in terms of full disclosure, I should also say I'm a corn breeder. My breeding work does not involve genetic engineering, so this is not something I do in my own research and plant breeding activities, but I do get called upon to explain it a lot. So I do a lot of extension talks talking about genetically engineered crops. I'd also like to thank you all for coming out. I'm so glad that you guys arranged this gorgeous October weather. I'm sure it's always like this up here in uh, West Chasey. Um, I grew up in western New York, so I know it's not, but it was a beautiful drive up here, so I really, really, really appreciated it, and thank you all for coming out on such a gorgeous evening. It's probably one of the last evenings you could want to be outside <laughs> comfortably without lots of clothing here in northern New York. Um, without further ado, then, I'm going to launch into my topic. I gave it this rather facetious name, who put those genes in my food? Um, that traces back to one of the questions I got after one of my talks about genetic engineering, and you'll understand this perhaps even better by the end of the talk. My, my goal when I speak to audiences is to, is to really help people understand what this technology is and what we know and don't know about it. It's not to tell you what to think, but it's to try and help give a simple explanation of what genetic engineering is. So after I gave one of these talks and went through my long explanation of everything that genetic engineering was and how it related to our past efforts in crop improvement, there was a, a lovely lady in the audience who raised her hand and rather wistfully said, I just wish I could still get a tomato without genes. And I thought, you know, Margaret, you have utterly failed, completely and utterly failed. So that's where who put those genes in my food comes from. <laughs> Believe it or not, your food all has genes in it. So, I'll talk about facts and myths about genetically engineered crops. I like to collect some of the cartoons that show up. This one is uh, one that I picked up recently, and you can see the pig that flies there. And the one on the left says, it's not the one who participated in the GMO program last year. And the other one says, of course, OMG. <laughs> so my amusing cartoon, there are no genetically engineered flying pigs. Yet. <laughs> Yet. <laughs> yeah, I think, th I think that would be a challenging one. I'm not sure a flying pig has any big advantage to anybody, so I doubt it's happening. This is what I hope to do tonight. I'm going to talk a little bit about why this is controversial. As a plant breeder, I can say we're not accustomed to showing up on the front pages of newspapers. It's unusual. So I'll talk about why the controversy, go through a little bit about what is genetic engineering, and try to put it in context of the previous change we have made, genetic changes we have made in our crops. We'll talk about what genetically engineered crops are out there, and then I'll go through a bit of a list of some of the primary questions and concerns I hear about and what we know about them. So I hope it won't be deadly, and I will do my best to make it flow along quickly so you're not here for too long. So why the controversy? When the first genetically engineered crops came on the market, which was actually in the mid-1990s, People like me, plant breeders in the seed industry, tended to say, oh, genetic engineering, it's just a logical extension of what plant breeders have been doing all along. Well, the problem with that was basically people said, who has been doing what? Because most people in this country are not farmers. They don't have a close connection to the seed industry or to the world of plant breeding, so there's really very little understanding of what plant breeding is or what it has done. Um, there was a scientist at Rutgers who did, a social scientist, who did a survey of the general public and asked this question, have you ever eaten a fruit or vegetable that's a product of traditional crossbreeding? And he did this survey explaining the idea behind traditional crossbreeding, that, that what it involves is taking one plant that has some desirable traits and crossing it to another with other desirable traits and trying to find a better version that came out of that, the progeny of that cross. So he asked this question, have you, ever in your life eaten a fruit or vegetable that was a product of traditional crossbreeding. We're going to do a little public survey here to see how many people think, uh, how, I'm going to ask you if you, what percentage of the population you think answered this question with a no, okay? Probably 95%. <laughs> well, thankfully it wasn't quite that bad. <laughs> so how many people would vote for 50% or less? Yeah, you can tell that's not the right answer by the way I asked the question. <laughs> How about 50 to 60? 60 to 70? Yeah, we're getting there. 70 to 80? More than 80%? No, you said 95. I heard you can't raise your hand. <laughs> Actually, 61% of the people said no, and another 11% said they weren't sure. 
So that's nearly three quarters of the population that believes they have never eaten a fruit or vegetable that was a product of traditional crossbreeding or they're not so sure they have. When in fact they have probably eaten nothing but, except for maybe the wild strawberries they gathered or the wild blueberries or some wild grapes or plums or something, every fruit and vegetable we eat is a product of traditional crossbreeding. So I think that re-emphasizes that people don't realize that there has been any genetic change in our crops to date. The genetically engineered products that are out there are not particularly things that offer benefits to consumers, clear benefits to consumers. They certainly offer some advantages to producers. The connection to consumers is much more tenuous. And as with any technology, there are concerns that get raised. This is true of any technology. So when you add those pieces of the equation together, it's not really any surprise that people were a little alarmed and it has raised a lot of concerns. Okay, I want to take a moment to try and get terms straight because this is one of the areas where I think we get ourselves at cross purposes and confused. So I'm going to talk about three terms, biotechnology, genetic engineering, and my very least favorite one you will come to learn, GMOs. So biotechnology, if you look it up in the dictionary, is this, the use of a biological organism in a technical application, bio and technology. <coughs> that is a very old thing. We use a lot of biological organisms like yeast, bacteria, fungi, in technical food production processes, brewing, baking, and so on. So dictionary definition of biotechnology is this kind of use of biology in technical processes. Very old, been around for a long time. Most people when they say the word biotechnology do not mean this. What they really mean is genetic engineering, which is a much more recent subset of biotechnology. Genetic engineering involves altering the properties of an organism by either moving genes between organisms, and what's not written up there is the fact that usually those are organisms which are not sexually cross-compatible, for example, a bacterium and a corn. I can go out in my corn nursery and throw a lot of bacteria on the silks and I will never get <laughs> seed from them, right? So those are not cross-compatible. Or by modifying a gene that already exists within an organism. Our understanding of the genetic code has now allowed us to be able to go in and actually read that code and manipulate it or change it. This can include several things. It can include changing when or where genes are expressed. So you should know that every cell of an organism's body, and this includes yours, carries a copy of the entire genetic sequence, the entire code that allows you to grow, live, and function. But you certainly don't want all those genes expressed in every cell of your body. You know, having the ones that cause you to produce fingernails expressed all over your face would be really disturbing, okay? So genes are expressed only at particular times in the development of an organism and in particular parts of the organism's body. That's, the, that's how the, the regulation takes place and that regulation is part of the genetic code. You can change that through genetic engineering. A gene that is not normally expressed, you can cause it to perhaps be expressed. You can also do what we consider correcting a defective gene. And this is the area we tend to hear about when we see on the front pages of newspapers, unfortunately, the results of efforts at human gene therapy. So for people, for example, who have a genetic mutation, a genetic change that makes it difficult for them to metabolize a particular amino acid or food, it causes a genetic, what we refer to as a genetic disease. And there is the hope that we might be able to actually correct that for people. Human gene therapy, correcting a defective gene. The last one there, moving a gene to a different host, is really where our genetically engineered crops that we currently have being produced in this country reside. They're crops that include genes that were derived from outside of the species boundary of that crop. So let's take a moment. I'm a geneticist, so I have to tell you about genetic material to talk about that. The genetic material is the deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA. This is the code book for making an organism grow and function. It includes both codes that tell, tell about what structural products should be produced to make the actual physical body of the organism, and also that regulation I talked about earlier of when and where genes are expressed. The amazing thing about this code is it's essentially written in an alphabet of four letters, the four base pairs that form the core 
of this model of a DNA molecule are adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine. We call them A, T, G, and C for short. There won't be a quiz after this, so you don't need to remember that. The A, T, G, and C are the four letters of the genetic code. Now, stop for a moment and think. If you were actually to try and write out in English or any other favorite language you have, the instructions for producing an organism as simple as, for example, a yeast cell. It's a single-celled organism. It's able to eat some food, produce some carbon dioxide, multiply, that's all it does. To write those instructions in English would take a number of volumes and we don't even entirely understand it. And here you have a code of four letters that can fit in a molecule inside that cell that provides all that information. It's an amazing and marvelous thing. And more incredible still, this code is universal. Every organism you see, from a mouse to a yeast cell to a corn plant, an oak tree, a blue whale, you, uses that same exact code. Okay, Different sequences of those to make each organism different, but the same four-letter code. It's an incredible thing. The universality of that code is what allows genetic engineering to work, such that when you identify a genetic sequence in a bacteria that allows it to break down a common herbicide like glyphosate, and you move that genetic sequence into a crop like soybean, the machinery of the soybean cell that reads the genetic code reads along there and does not suddenly stop and say, uh-oh, here's something from a bacteria. It just looks like more A, T, Gs, and Cs. So, for example, when somebody writes a note to their friend after this lecture and says, that speaker put me to sleep, and decides that, you know, that's not extreme enough, and they copy the word really out of another document and stick it in there, and it says, that speaker really put me to sleep. Well, the person that reads that is not going to say, oh, look, they stuck the word really in there. It's going to look just like it was there all the time to the reader. And that's essentially the way it works in a crop plant when you stick genetic sequence from another organism in there. It looks just like A, T, Gs, and Cs that probably had been there all along. So that universality is what's central to the um, ability to make genetic engineering work. I want to draw a distinction. I'm not telling you that this is the same as traditional crossbreeding. In traditional crossbreeding, you might take a parent a soybean and cross it with another soybean. I've depicted genes as if they were beads on a string here in this picture. We know it's more complex, but this will do for now. You cross those two together. You grow out the offspring and the offspring, just like your kids, include a mix of traits from the two parents. The plant breeder's job then is to try and find the one that when you cross a disease-resistant one and a high-yielding one, most of the progeny are low-yielding to disease-susceptible. So your job is to try and find that one unique one that happened to actually get the genes you wanted, okay? the mix you wanted. That's traditional crossbreeding. Combines many genes from a pair of parents that are cross-compatible. Genetic engineering, on the other hand, you might start with a commercial variety. And an organism that you have identified a gene that would be useful to have in. That process in itself is not simple. You identify that gene, you can cut it, literally with a molecular scissors, cut it out of there, and then by a rather complex process, insert it into your commercial variety to give you a genetically engineered or a transgenic variety. In this case, you've added one or a few genes to a particular parent, so it looks very genetically similar except for this little addition in here. So that's the difference between genetic engineering and traditional crossbreeding. I want to now talk about my least favorite term, genetically modified organisms or GMOs. And I want you, this is another thought exercise like the one we did with the uh, yeast organism and writing the encyclopedia for how to make it work. What do the words genetic modification mean? And I'm going to walk you through some examples of what I think they might mean. The earliest process of genetic modification I think we've engaged in is one called domestication. This over here is the wild ancestor of the crop I work with. It's called Tiacinte. It has inside this seed head about 10 seeds covered with a seed coat that is so hard it's completely indigestible. So the only way you get nutrition out of them is to crack them open. It shatters when it's mature, so these 10 little brown seeds fall all over the ground. Somewhere in the history of our agricultural development, somebody discovered that this could be a useful food. 
and they began to save seeds of it. And they began to save seeds that made it a little more convenient as a food crop. How? Well, every time that genetic code is copied, which has to happen every time cells divide, each cell needs a copy of the genetic code, every time it's copied, just like every time I copy something, there's the possibility to make a mistake. And mistakes happen pretty frequently and pretty regularly. They're called mutations. They occur naturally. Most of them are undesirable to the plant. A few of them are neutral to the plant, and an even smaller proportion are desirable to us as humans who want to eat this as food. So mutations that made those seeds larger, made them stick to the cob when they matured rather than falling off, got rid of that indigestible seed coat, and a few others transformed teosinte into something that essentially looks like domesticated corn. That early process of domestication, which took place with all of our domesticated crops, was the first example of genetic modification from the natural wild species to something we were beginning to tinker and tailor to make it more useful to us. Since then, farmers around the world have selected many different types and varieties to fit their particular environments, agroecologies, food preferences, color preferences. I love this set of crops here. It's always a test of how alert I am, whether I can recite them all correctly, but cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, kale, kohlrabi, and Brussels sprouts. No, kale, kohlrabi, and Brussels sprouts. Um, they are all exactly the same species. We think of them as completely different crops. They trace back to the same small mustard plant ancestor. In the different places where these crops evolved, different societies decided that different parts of that plant was a useful thing to eat. And you always select for a larger and larger size of the plant part that you consume because that means it's producing more food for you. So somewhere in our agricultural domestication history, somebody thought the lateral buds of this little mustard were the right thing to eat. The lateral buds must have been about the size of a pinhead in this crop. But gradually they selected for larger and larger lateral buds and you ended up with Brussels sprouts. Another society thought it was the stem. They ended up with the kohlrabi because they picked things which made fatter and fatter stems. All accumulation of mutations, genetic changes that happened to be desirable to that agricultural community at that time. Certainly now, we do a lot of development of varieties through crossbreeding, and certainly we also are altering them through genetic engineering. To my mind, all of these are processes of genetic modification. And to call only the one at the bottom there, the genetically engineered crops, genetically modified organisms, suggests that our crops were not really genetically altered in any way prior to this. And that's certainly not true. If it were, we'd all be eating this stuff. You know, the teosinte with the 10 indigestible seeds, the mustard that gave rise to uh, Brussels sprouts and broccoli and all that stuff, nothing much edible there, some wild grapes maybe, some grains that have seeds about the size of your lawn grass. You know, that's, that's the wild ancestors of the things that make up our food supply today. So there has been a profound process of genetic modification for the tens of thousands of years, or the thousands of years, I should say, seven to 9,000 years, since the dawn of settled agriculture until now. Genetic engineering is a new and different way to do that, but layered on top of this context of profound genetic change. So what are the genetically engineered crops that are out there? I find there's a tremendous amount of confusion about this. So we'll, we'll take a moment. I'm going to run long at this rate. We'll take a moment to do another survey, if it's OK with you, Rick. So I'm going to throw out some crops. And why don't you guys raise your hands if you think there are genetically engineered varieties being grown commercially now. OK, you ready? Wheat. OK. Uh, corn. Yeah. Alfalfa. Um, sugar beet, yeah. Um, peas. Uh, that was peas, not tea. I don't think there's any tea. Um, apples. Uh, soybeans. I already said that, right? Okay. That was not bad. Pretty much everyone said yes to everything. Um, <laughs> that is not correct. There is no genetically engineered wheat being grown commercially. There is no genetically engineered oats being grown commercially. I didn't ask you that. There are no genetically engineered apples being grown commercially. Pretty much the only ones that are, have been or are out there are these. The flavor saver tomato. I mention it because it was the first genetically engineered crop marketed. It is no longer being marketed. 
It was a cool example of actually changing a gene that was already present in the tomato. So um, researchers in that case identified a gene which is associated with a process called after ripening. In normal language, that means getting mushy on your shelf. Okay, so when you buy a tomato and you leave it out there, it gets soft and mushy. If you, they, they identified a gene that was a critical part of that process of getting mushy, which is useful to the tomato because that's how the seeds mature to grow the next generation, but not so useful to us, right? And they sequenced it. They figured out what the genetic code of that gene was, and then they made a copy in reverse and put it back into the tomato. So they put a, a synthesized tomato gene back into the tomato. If you have a gene and it's reverse copy, it's the nature of um, reading genetic sequences that those two match up with each other and therefore their expression is canceled out. I can explain that in more detail, but it's way more genetics than probably most of you care to know. But that's what happens when you put a mirror image of the gene in. It cancels its expression. So this tomato sat on the shelf looking nice and ripe and red and firm for a longer period of time. Not forever, but a lot longer. Gave more time to market it, more time for you to consume it. The challenge, so the, the genetic engineering worked quite well. The challenge with the Flavor Saver tomato is the company that was doing it did not have a lot of experience in tomato breeding or, or uh, variety marketing. And they forgot that there are 32,000 genes in a tomato. And one gene does not make a great variety. So they happened to do the genetic engineering in a variety that was just not a very good production tomato. It didn't work well for the growers. It was hard to manage. So it just didn't cut it in the market. So Flavor Saver was only marketed very, very briefly. And it was actually marketed mostly on the West Coast with advertisements saying new genetically engineered tomato. It was at a time where that was viewed as a selling point. Come and gone. Has anybody ever had a flavor saver in here? I have not, so I should, I'm just <laughs> raising my hand because I do it automatically. Um, the crops that are out there now, one big category is the BT crops. These are crops that have been engineered with a gene from a uh, bacterium. It's a bacterium that has been marketed for many, many years as an organic insecticide. So it's actually a, a disease of insects, this bacterium. It causes disease in insects, particularly caterpillars and beetles. People identified the gene out of the bacterium that produces the protein that becomes, in the insect's gut, toxic to the insect, and built it into crops. So corn, both field corn and sweet corn, cotton, um, are the major BT crops that are being marketed commercially now. They're insect resistant. Another big category is the herbicide-resistant crops. These have had a gene derived from a soil bacteria that happens to break down one of, or another of two basic herbicides. One of them is glyphosate, or Roundup. The other is glufosinate, mostly marketed as Liberty. By far the most common of those two is the glyphosate-resistant, or Roundup-ready crops. These herbicides have been engineered into a series of crops. You see here soybean, canola, cotton, corn, alfalfa. There's also sugar beet and a few others. So that when you can, you can plant those crops and then spray as the crop grows over the top of them with an herbicide that normally just kills plants in general. And it will kill pretty much all the plants in the field except the one that's been genetically engineered to be able to break down the herbicide, the Roundup resistant one. And the third category is virus-resistant crops, primarily papaya and some summer squashes, red and green, uh, pardon me, yellow and green summer squashes have been genetically engineered for virus resistance. This is done in, in a way that's very similar to the way we get vaccinated to prevent us from getting diseases. You actually take part of the genetic sequence of the coat that the virus protein sits in, and you put it into the plant, and it's similar to vaccinating the plant. It looks to the virus as if that plant is already colonized, so it will not infect it. Papaya grown in Hawaii, that essentially was a, a rescue to the papaya industry in Hawaii that was about to go down to papaya ring spot virus with no prospects for controlling it. And the uh, yellow and green summer squash marketed very, very little. These are most of the genetically engineered crops that are out there now. There's a lot of confusion that it's in everything and everywhere. It is, in fact, not. And most of the acreage is corn, cotton, and soybean in this country. 
So with that as introduction, I want to run through several issues and concerns that I tend to hear about. We'll talk a little bit about each of these. So extent of use, how broadly used are these and where are they used? Costs and benefits, environmental impacts, food safety and allergens, right to know on labeling, one of those ones that's in the news a lot these days, consolidation in agricultural industries and their profits, and finally I'll make a mention at the end about belief systems. These are all concerns I hear from audiences as I speak to them about genetically engineered crops. So let's start with who's growing them and where. I'm going to show you a few graphs and I'll try to walk you through these. They look very complicated, but they're not. This one is global. So this is the global area of genetically engineered crops being planted. 1996 was the first year that any genetically engineered crop was commercialized. The far right here is 2013. I have not seen 2014 data yet. This is in um, hectares. I'm trying to see my scale over there. <laughs> Million hectares, is that what it says? The curtains are in the way, so you guys have to tell me if I'm right or wrong. So a hectare is about two and a half acres, so you can translate up. This would be 250 million acres right there. The only countries that are on here specified are countries that have more than a million hectares or more than two and a half million acres of genetically engineered crops planted. So a few things you can notice, a quite a steady and rapid adoption, increase in area. The biggest player in this market by far is the United States, where the blue part of the bar at the bottom. That's followed by Brazil, Argentina, India, Canada, China, a few other small players, and the entire rest of the world is sort of the invisible thin slice on the very top of these bars. So a few take home messages, one is Fairly rapid adoption. Two is the United States has certainly got the biggest acreage of genetically engineered crops right now. And three is that there are relatively few players. You know, this is about, what, 10 countries that I've peeled off here that have more than a million hectares that account for almost all the global acreage of genetically engineered crops. I wanted to put this in perspective of total annual crop area around the world. And that turns out that's a pretty hard thing to do. But I did try to dig through some uh, food and agriculture organization statistics. And this is about the best I could come up with. If I add everything together, and you know, I would regard this as a very shaky number, but there's almost 900 million hectares of annual crops planted globally in 2010. This bar is just about at 150 million hectares, so that's about a sixth of that area. So not insignificant. And in part, that's because some of the crops we talked about, corn, and soybean and cotton are very large acreage crops globally. Okay. okay, next I'll show you some data for the US. And this is for the three major crops that the USDA actually tracks their use, corn, cotton, and soybeans. And this is field corn. The USDA does not track sweet corn, so it's very difficult to get data on that. So US field corn acreage, this scale, unlike the other one, is percent of total US acreage, okay? So starting in 1996, again up to 2013, the red part of the bar is acreage planted to herbicide tolerant corn varieties. The yellow part would be BT or insect resistant corn varieties. And where it starts to turn orange here is where the industry began to stack both of those traits together. So the varieties in here would have both herbicide tolerance and BT-based insect resistance. So a few things to notice. Adoption relatively rapid. More th about 90% of US corn acreage, field corn acreage right now, is planted to genetically engineered varieties, most of which have both herbicide resistance and insect resistance traits engineered into them. Picture for cotton quite similar. I'll mention cotton since it's such a big crop up here in northern New York. Um, it perhaps even more rapid adoption, but again we've leveled out up here at about 90 percent of U.S. cotton acreage, the majority of which has both BT genes for insect resistance and herbicide tolerant genes built into it. And third, soybean. Soybean, the only kind of varieties that are genetically engineered that are commercialized, have herbicide tolerance. These are all Roundup Ready or glyphosate resistant soybeans. And you can see very rapid adoption, and we're about 92 or 93 percent of U.S. soybean acreage planted to genetically engineered varieties. So these three crops, the portion of U.S. acreage that is planted to genetically engineered varieties is 90 percent or more 
very, very high. Let's talk for a moment about cost, benefits, and environmental impacts. And the best way I can think of to address this <coughs> is to look at what solid peer-reviewed scientific studies have to say. As a scientist, that's what I go to for something that has the credibility to say, yes, this was a well-designed study and we think it, it was done well. The National Research Council of the National Academies of Sciences did a study at, that they published in 2010, so relatively recently, that looked at farm level impacts of adoption of genetically engineered crops. So I'm going to tell you a few results from that, and it was based on a pretty big evaluation of all the peer-reviewed literature they could find that talked about farm level impacts. These are some of the things they concluded about what impacts the adoption of genetically engineered crops had had at the farm level. First one, they said since that adoption began in 1996, we see a higher level of herbicide being used. However, there's been a switch in types of herbicide from a less environmentally friendly ones to somewhat more environmentally friendly ones. So perhaps less toxic herbicides being used. They also noted that this broad adoption of basically Roundup Ready or glyphosate resistant crops had allowed more use of reduced tillage, which has environmental benefits because you're reducing erosion and a few other complications resulting from excessive tillage. So I want to show you for a moment what the, we'll diverge from the findings for a moment and I'll show you a little bit about what that herbicide data looks like. Um, Here's a graph that shows from 1996 again, and it, uh, the study ended in 2007. This little dotted line here is the rate of adoption, percentage of acreage of soybeans planted to genetically engineered herbicide resistant varieties. This line here is herbicide use, pounds of in active ingredient per acre of non-glyphosate herbicides. And this line here, is pounds of active ingredient per acre of, you guessed it, glyphosate, because these are re glyphosate resistant soybeans. So you can see big increase of glyphosate use, big decrease in use of other herbicides. That said, if you add these two up, that comes out to a little less than 1.2 pounds total active ingredient per acre. Now that number is closer to 1.3 or a little more. So herbicide use total went up a bit, the mix of herbicides being used changed, and a slightly less toxic ones, we think, are being used. These are some of the subtleties in the data that make it very hard to figure out where the truth lies in this subject area. And I'll talk for a moment about that because I think it's important to realize. With data like this, if you happen to be somebody who is in favor of genetic engineering, you're going to point to this National Research Council study and say, look, a less toxic herbicide is being used and we're having reduced tillage, which is good for the environment. That would be true. If you don't like genetically engineered crops, you're going to point to this data and say, look, total herbicide use went up, which is true. Both of those are parts of the picture. So part of the complication is that there's, the picture is complex, and if you only point to a part of it, you can probably find a part that supports the argument you wish to make, but there are more parts to the argument. Another part that we're beginning to see now is concern with weeds that are evolving resistance to glyphosate. This is a really neat study I'll mention briefly. They compared areas in Europe where genetically engineered crops are not used, but glyphosate is used because they have about the same mix of crops that, that we grow here, and they, they tend to use it for um, between season wheat control. From 1974, when glyphosate was first coming out, up until 2009, when the study ended, and over that 35-year period, seven weeds evolved resistance to glyphosate or Roundup. This is something that happens. Organisms evolve. When you use a control measure on them, they generally don't just roll over, die, and leave the face of the earth. Those few that have some genetic mutation that allows them to survive better despite what you're doing to control them, multiply and become a bigger and bigger part of the population, and they slowly evolve to overcome whatever we're doing to control them. So not surprising. Weeds can evolve resistance to glyphosate. However, if you compare that to areas in the US, since genetically engineered glyphosate-resistant crops were introduced, 
which was in 1996. Over this short 13-year period, we see nine weed species that evolved resistance. So is the rate of evolution of resistance faster? Oh yeah. Why? Because we're using glyphosate so widely. The more frequently and the more broadly you use any given pest control measure, the more likely the pests are to evolve resistance. This is not new with genetic engineering. This is a lesson we have all learned in many ways about integrated pest management. We've learned it in the human arena. If you use the same antibiotic over and over and over again, the bacteria become resistant. So this is not new. We just kind of forgot, I think. We have not been as careful as we should in how we use this technology. And this is what it looks like. This is actually um, glyphosate resistant palmer amaranth. It's a species of amaranth in a cotton field, a Roundup resistant cotton field. And you can see the, the glyphosate or Roundup that was applied over the top here is doing nothing on that amaranth. So there are some really problematic weeds that are evolving as a result of this. We need to be more careful how we use this technology. Okay, so enough about herbicide. The study also found that less insecticide was being used with the adoption of genetically engineered crops. This is what that looks like for corn and for cotton. Here is the adoption of genetically engineered insect resistant corns as a percentage of US acreage. Here is insecticide use active ingredient per acre. Same thing for cotton. The curve bumps around a bit more. Cotton insects are many and problematic, but ultimately levels out with the adoption of BT cotton at a much lower level of insecticide use. So that's been a plus. Gene flow, this study determined that it had not been a concern to date. What that refers to is the potential for a genetically engineered trait through cross-pollination to move into another crop. For many of the genetically engineered crops we have in the US, there's nothing other than that crop they would cross-pollinate. So corn, it's very cross-pollinating, but it only pollinates corn. We do not live in the home of its wild ancestor, Tiacinte. That would be Mexico and Central America. There, the corn could pollinate the Tiacinte, and you could have a gene flow, flow of those genetically engineered traits into that other species. Okay? Not a concern to date. Soybeans and cotton are highly, highly self-pollinating, so they don't tend to pollinate anything. So we're fortunate in that regard. They concluded that many farmers had benefited economically in worker safety. This is probably a function of the use of less insecticide and less toxic herbicides, and certainly in convenience. They said the effects on prices, this is where they started to waffle, okay? The effects on prices on producers who were, chose not to grow genetically engineered varieties, and the social impacts were not fully understood. And then they really waffled and said, we need more study of market concentration. So some things they had better data than others. That was their conclusions with regard to farm level impacts. I'm gonna move on pretty promptly here because it's getting late to food safety and allergens, probably one of the things people are most concerned about. And the big question I get is, am I eating foods derived from genetically engineered crops? Well, are you? Yes. Yeah. yes, the answer is yes. Okay, so the estimate in the US is that 60 to 70% of our supermarket foods contain ingredients that came from a genetically engineered variety. When I say supermarket foods, I'm referring to things like this, bottles, cans, packages, containers, things that are packaged or processed foods. Obviously, the, the ones that are easy to spot would be things made with soy or corn. 90% of our acreage in this country is genetically engineered varieties. So if you're going to be getting uh, cornmeal, cornstarch, soybean oil, chances are it was derived from a genetically engineered variety. There are a whole slew of products we don't tend to think about as corn, soybean, or cotton, but that contain ingredients derived from them. So these are all examples. Ketchup, it has corn syrup in it. Uh, baking powder, it has corn starch in it. Rice aroni, you know, you find corn ingredients. All of these things, many, many things have corn or soybean or cotton derived ingredients in them. Fresh produce, it's very, very limited. About the only thing we would find perhaps in a grocery store or on a mark, uh, farm stand around here would be insect resistant sweet corn. That is in the fresh market. It's not at all in the processed, canned, or frozen corn market but there are fresh market growers who use genetically engineered sweet corn. Otherwise, it's papaya, only marketed on the west coast, the genetically engineered varieties. 
and maybe summer squash, but that's seen very, very limited use by growers. I'll talk a moment about how we approve the cultivation of genetically engineered crops. This is the responsibility of three different agencies, so it's a rather complicated process. The U.S. Department of Agriculture assesses their safety for environmental release. That includes concerns about gene flow or any other potential environmental impacts. The Environmental Protection Agency is responsible for what's called the safety of included pesticides. So the Bt protein that produces a toxin inside the gut of an insect is considered an included pesticide in Bt crops. They also have to label herbicide use on herbicide tolerant crops. And finally, the Food and Drug Administration is the agency that's responsible for assessing safety as food and as feed. This is the area where most people's concerns reside. And I want to talk about testing for food safety because it's not necessarily an easy thing to do. The way we do this for genetically engineered traits or for food additives or new food preservatives or food dyes or any other thing we're adding, pesticide residues, anything that's on our food, is to focus on the compound that is novel or unique. So in other words, the new additive or the new protein that the genetically engineered crop is producing. So you focus on that. You test it by delivering a high dose to some sort of a laboratory animal over a short period of time. Now, I bet there's some of you in the room that remember the whole thing with artificial sweeteners in diet soda that hit the fan uh, several decades ago. We won't go into how many, a number of decades ago. And this is exactly what they did. I think it was saccharin, right? They, they delivered large amounts of it to laboratory animals and determined that at those high doses, it could cause cancers, I think it was, problems. If you looked at actually what that would equate to in terms of your consumption of diet soda, it was something like, you know, you would get that dose if you consumed 60 diet sodas a day. So this is how we test it. It gives us a very high margin of security because we know we're not consuming 60 diet sodas a day, but if you can offer that much to an animal and it still is okay, you know, you're probably all right. But this is how we do it, very high dose over a short period of time. That is what is done with the new protein that a genetically engineered crop produces. The whole crop itself, in most cases, does not get tested for food safety. And this is the part that makes people very nervous. So they will say, well, has that genetically engineered corn been tested for food safety? Well, no, we tested the protein the BT gene makes, or we tested the protein that the herbicide tolerance gene makes. And the reason for this, this isn't just casual, like, we don't care. The reason is this. If you did toxicology tests like that on normal foods, you would find that they are not, they reveal all these anti-nutritional effects. And it's the same phenomenon as if everyone in this room decided to go on the carrot diet and we all ate nothing but carrots for a week. Are carrots good for you? Sure. If you eat nothing but carrots and we all come back in here next week, we will all be orange and we will have a disease called carotitis. <laughs> Why? <laughs> well, because we ate way too many carrots and got way too many of a few nutrients and nowhere near enough of a whole lot of other things we need to be healthy. So if you took genetically engineered soybeans or non-genetically engineered soybeans and fed just soybeans in this very high dose to a laboratory animal over a short period of time, it would not be well. And it would not be well because it's not getting a balanced diet. So the challenge is, it's like this guy in the 1500s said, Paracelsus, he was the father of toxicology. He said the dose makes the poison. Too much carrots and they become toxic. They are not a bad food. But if you have way too much of that and not enough of other things, it becomes not good for you. The challenge is that we do not have good tests for chronic health risks at low doses in mixed diets, which is exactly how we consume our food. So is this a comfortable message for people? Well, probably not. But frankly, as a, as a scientist who's thought about it a lot, I'm no food chemist or no toxicologist, but I really do not see a more effective way to go about this. If the non-genetically engineered food is going to reveal anti-nutritional effects, what then do you compare to? Challenging. <laughs>
So safety testing, there are conditions under which food safety testing of the whole food is mandatory. And those would be if the genetically engineered crop differs in some significant way nutritionally from a non-genetically engineered crop, in other words, it's not substantially equivalent to the non-genetically engineered one, you must test it. If you've used new antibiotic resistance markers, I'm not going to go into that in detail right now, but I can answer questions about it if you want. If there are uncharacterized genetic elements, little pieces of genetic material that we don't know what they're doing in there, any indication of higher toxin levels or any indication of potentially allergenic proteins, any one of these would trigger mandatory food safety testing. So of the genetically engineered crops out there, are there any that have had mandatory food safety testing triggered? No. They have, none of the new proteins have been found to be risky in terms of toxins or allergenicity. No uncharacterized genetic elements, none of this. And they were all found to be substantially equivalent in terms of nutritionally important composition to a non-genetically engineered variety of that same crop. Not comforting, but that's, that's the way it is. Here's some of the additional challenges. In our food supply, corn and soybeans and cottonseed and stuff like that are commodity crops. The genetically engineered varieties and the non-genetically engineered varieties all get fed into the same harvesting trucks and grain silos and so on and moved into the food production process here. If they're sold in the market as whole foods or grains, you can actually measure whether there is genetically engineered DNA or that new protein it produces in those whole foods. But once you start moving to refined ingredients like syrups, flours, oils, or even more the derivatives that come from these crops like vitamins and soy lecithin and MSG and all that stuff, these are highly refined. They don't carry genetic material and they don't carry protein. Corn syrup is sugar and water. It's all that's in there. There's no protein and there's no DNA. So you can measure the chemi chemistry, the chemical content of corn syrup from a genetically engineered variety and corn syrup from a non-genetically engineered variety and they will be identical because all that's in there is sugar and water. This makes it very difficult to figure out. That's why those estimates are there about where this is in our food supply. It's not like you can go grab products off the grocery store shelf and test them. You won't find it in most cases. That brings me to right to know and labeling because that is one of the fundamental challenges to labeling. Labeling of genetically engineered foods is, uh, is something that is challenging in this country because most of our labeling is product based. In other words, it tells you something about the content in the package. The qualities of the product are considered nutritional values, toxicities, allergenicities. And labeling is required only if the product is somehow different, not substantially equivalent to a non-genetically engineered product. There are countries where they use what's called process-based labeling. Okay? The European Union would be an example of this. This tells you not necessarily anything about the content of what's in the package, but rather it tells you how it was produced. So in that case, labeling is required if ingredients in that package are derived from a genetically engineered crop, even though there may be no measurable difference between the product as produced with ingredients from the genetically engineered crop and the product produced with ingredients from the non-genetically engineered crop. So it's about the process, not about what's in the box. We do have one big example in this country of process-based labeling. Does anybody know what that would be? Most of our labeling is product-based in the food area. Certified organic. The certified organic label tells you about the process of producing that food. It doesn't necessarily tell you anything about its nutritional value or anything else. It tells you about a set of practices that were used and other practices that were not used, the process of producing it. So we do have precedent for this. The labeling bills that are out there now are really um, aiming to put a process-based label on genetic engineering. This is another one of those cases where it becomes complicated when you look at the common food ingredients that are derived from corn and soybean. This is a very partial list. I don't expect you to read all of those. There are many. If you pull off a label off of a packaged product in the grocery store, 
everything that has a star on it on this label, which I think is for cookies because it starts off with chocolate fudge filling there. Um, all of those are ingredients that might likely be derived from a genetically engineered variety because they go back to corn, soybean, cottonseed. If you ask the question, do consumers want labeling, the answer depends on how you ask the question. This question, should genetically modified food be required to be labeled? Clearly, 73% response rate said yes. If you ask people, what information would you like to see on food labels that's not already there? 7% say genetic engineering. So it's another one of those great cases where, depending on which point of view you want to argue about this topic, you will choose which of those questions you want to show the data for, right? Um, I talk a lot to the uh, consumer person at Wegmans. Um, I've gotten to know her from being on a few panels. And, you know, there are not many consumer questions at grocery stores, but she says inquiries at Wegmans are up, and particularly since the um, news about labeling bills in Vermont and other places has been coming out, people are beginning to inquire more about this. So it is getting bigger on the grocery store radar screen. I think I have two quick slides about this, and then I'll be on wrap-up. Sorry, Rick, too long. Um, the, uh, there's, there are some people who are very concerned about genetically engineered traits being controlled by a small number of large seed companies. This pie chart here shows you, it's called deregulations that were approved. When you want to commercialize a genetically engineered crop variety, you apply to the government to say, will you deregulate this? In other words, will you allow it to be grown commercially without any special regulations? So if I developed Margaret's genetically engineered corn, I would have to apply if I wanted to sell that seed commercially for deregulation. And what this pie chart shows you is who originally got the approval and how many different approvals they hold. Approval or deregulation approval does not necessarily mean you commercialized it. There are certainly things on here that were approved and never commercialized. Maybe the market didn't look good enough to justify the cost. It didn't pan out, whatever. But these are the things that could have been commercialized in the U.S. A total of 100 approvals. About a third of them were by, guess who? Monsanto. Um, a number of other companies. Over here is Cornell One. We're in the one department. Anybody know what that one is from Cornell? Papaya. Very good. Genetically engineered papaya. We had a native Hawaiian who used to work at the experiment station in Geneva, and he was right across the hall from the guy that invented the gene gun, which is one way you can shoot genetic material into another species. And he saw the Hawaiian papaya industry going down the tubes to papaya ring spot virus. So this is why Cornell has the permission to commercialize the genetically engineered papaya. Take a look at this pie chart, you know, a little visual image. Something that happened along the way in the same time period when genetically engineered crops were becoming more commonly grown was that there was a lot of consolidation in the seed industry. I don't know that this was driven by genetic engineering. Certainly it's an expensive technology, so if you've invested a lot to develop a product, you probably have an interest in as many seed outlets for that product as you can get. So this did help people who had invested in genetic engineering to buy up other companies. Bottom line is, this is who got the original approval. This is what the picture looks like now, okay? So this is consolidation. Monsanto has bought a lot of companies, Aventus a number, Syngenta a number, DuPont, and there's a few here that are still independent. Thankfully, Cornell, is, we haven't been purchased yet, so that's good, we're good. But this is why people are concerned about consolidation. You know, you got four big conglomerates here that hold the permissions to commercialize more than three quarters of the ones that have been approved, okay? So there is consolidation. This is also the reason that, uh, part of the reason why Monsanto has become synonymous with GMOs. You know, they are clearly the biggest player in this market. Is that too much? Is that not enough? That's a societal value decision. This is not a researchable question. It's something we need to decide as a society. Are we worried about that degree of consolidation or monopolization or not? So that brings me back to my list of issues and concerns. The first, the ones, the ones on the top of the list here, you know, how much are they used? What are the costs and benefits, environmental impacts, food safety, allergens? We can do research on these and shed light on them and learn more about them. 
The ones below that line here, right to know and labeling, consolidation, and obviously belief systems, these are things which are rooted in societal values. I can't do a, a scientific study to say, should we label or should we not label? We can do surveys to see what people think, but there's not kind of a right and wrong answer to that. It's a value judgment. So some of these are, here, are things which we have to decide informed by science, but based on our values as a society. So we have to, for better or worse, rely on the political process for those. I won't go any further with that. I want to end with risk perception. Um, I was shared a panel with a philosopher who's had this to say about risk. He said, safety, we use that term a lot, it actually refers to the acceptability of the risks because every technology, everything we do has risks associated with it. Acceptability of risks is not an objective feature of any technology. Acceptability is subjective. Here's a great piece of evidence. You all drove here tonight, right? Getting in your car and having an accident is probably one of the most common ways to get hurt or killed, yet we do it all the time. Why? It's convenient. We feel like we're in control. You know, it's the other guy that might screw up, but we can avoid that. We love the benefits, and we have gotten very used to the risks, okay? <laughs> Acceptability of those risks is a subjective judgment we make based on the extent to which we feel like we have control and the extent to which we um, value the benefits. So acceptability, rather than being objective, is really the actual acceptance by the people who are bearing the risk. As a society, we've decided to accept the risk of automobiles. They're just so convenient to us. There are other risks we're not so sure about. So why the concern about this? Clearly, we do a lot of risky things in our lives, some of them more and some of them less. But we really don't expect there to be risks, or we're not used to there being any kind of risks associated with our whole foods. I don't see risks with the genetically engineered crops we have out there right now. But they certainly raise concerns. And that's something that people are not used to having with respect to our whole foods. They're part of our daily life. We like to eat them three times a day. We have very intimate cultural relationships with them. They're important to us. So in closing, here's what I would say. The products of genetic engineering are going to have risks and benefits that are very crop and trait specific. So this is not a technology we should paint with one big brush, nor the it's all good brush, nor the it's all bad brush. We need to really think about each example of where we use this technology and weigh the risks and benefits. I think that's arguably true for virtually every technology. You know, people who invented refrigerants didn't invent them because they were going to destroy the ozone layer. They invented them because they were good refrigerants, and only over time did we begin to understand fully the profile of risks and benefits, and our view of them therefore changed. That's going to be the case with any technology, but we need to consider it on a case-by-case -case basis. It's a tool. It can be used in many ways. The fact that the things out there now are safe does not guarantee that every product you might develop will also be safe. Finally, I would say people ultimately will make choices about whether they accept or do not accept this, and I think those will be better choices if you actually can get access to balanced and honest information that doesn't try to argue a point of view but tries to help you understand. I hope I've achieved some of that tonight, and I will end there and say thank you very much for your attention. You've been very patient. Okay. Hi, thank you. I enjoyed the talk. Um, my question is, part of what we have here, I think, is also a timeline, as we've seen from 1996 forward. I want to know what your thoughts are about things like golden rice things that were from sort of past in history that were designed actually with advantageous traits to put food products or maybe something of a vitamin trait in areas where we really need or develop this. Do you think that we're actually going to move forward with this, seeing that most of the products are still being produced a lot in the United States and a lot of other places in the world, adaptation or acceptance is still fairly low? Yeah, that's a really great question. So I'll say a few words about golden rice just in case there are folks in the audience who are less familiar with it. Um, I mentioned in this talk that many of the products we have now focused on insect resistance, herbicide resistance, and virus resistance are not necessarily ones that offer direct benefit to consumers. And golden rice was, I think, a major effort to 
to offer something that was to benefit consumers and particularly the poorer of the poor around the world. Rice is a major staple food crop for many poor folks in the tropics and the subtropics. Many of those folks also suffer from vitamin A deficiency because their diet is heavily rice-based. You know, it's kind of the opposite of the carrots and carotitis diet I talked about. Um, so it's heavily rice-based with not enough other nutrients in it. So there was an effort to genetically engineer rice that would have in it those precursors your body needs to produce vitamin A, okay? And that if that could be done, and if it could be made available to poor rice farmers, this would offer them a tremendous benefit. Vitamin A deficiency is a real killer. It can not only cause blindness, but you can die from it. So it's a very, it's a very dramatic and major nutritional problem. Golden rice was developed, and it was developed with um, genes from daffodil, and some other, a couple other, three genes that made it produce those precursors, what we call pro-vitamin A, the compound your body uses to make vitamin A. And that, it, it now exists in a form that has enough of that pro-vitamin A in it to make it nutritionally valuable to populations that are consuming largely rice, okay? This work was done with funding primarily from the Rockefeller Foundation, so a philanthropic organization came in and provided the money and then there was a lot of negotiation with all the patent holders for the many pieces of the genetic engineering process to try and make it available. And they ultimately agreed, uh, this was a major effort, ultimately agreed to make that golden rice available to farmers whose incomes were below $10,000 a year without any additional fees. Now, $10,000 a year to most farmers in the, in the developing world is an unimaginably huge amount of money, so that pretty well encompassed everybody you might wish to make it available to. This, this work was all done in the late 1990s, maybe into early 2000, and there is still not a single acre of golden rice being grown commercially by a farmer. So you might ask why. There are many reasons for this. One piece of it is that... Um, the genetic engineering, again, was done in varieties that are not adapted necessarily to the areas where those farmers are growing their rice. So you have the same as the tomato problem. The other 32,000 genes in the plant need to work for the farmer, right? So that's one piece of the problem. So it takes time to breed that trait into other varieties. Also, although there are, there are small-scale rice farmers located all around the tropics of the world, they're in many different microclimates. And so you need to breed that trait not just into one or a few rice varieties, but many <coughs> rice varieties that have the eating quality that those different cultures require. If it won't make the foods they eat, they're not going to grow it. And rice, of all crops, has a huge array of grain size, grain shape, grain texture, cooking quality expectations. So that was a major hold up. I think they're getting close to having some of it available. But I think one of the things that story tells us is it's very appealing and a lot of people will claim that we need genetic engineering to solve the problems of the poorest of the poor, the hungriest in the developing world and so on. But this is expensive technology and it's not clear to me who is going to invest the money to develop the varieties that the poorest of the poor need because they are not seed purchasers. If you are not going to get a return in that investment, who is it going to be? And notice the, this investment was the Rockefeller Foundation. It was a philanthropic foundation. So in my world, in the world of corn, farmers in Africa could really use some genetically engineered varieties that have resistance to striga. It's a hugely damaging parasitic weed. It reduces your yield to zero. These are farmers for whom corn is their staple food crop. But who is going to invest in developing that? Is it the public sector? Well, how, how many people have seen public sector investment increasing lately? <laughs> you know, not me. <laughs> but, you know, there's, there's one limitation. Is it philanthropies? They have limited dollars. Is it the private sector? Not unless there's a way they're going to get a return on that investment. So who's going to do it? for those kind of populations who are not major seed markets is a very complex question. So I've been waxing poetic about your question. I think the other piece of it that, that is unrelated to golden rice, I think we will see golden rice used in the fullness of time. How broadly, I'm not sure. Um, 
in many parts of Asia, whiteness of rice is associated with purity and value and quality of rice. So how much are people going to accept yellow rice? You know, I'm not sure. Um, the other thing we're beginning to see now is a clear move on the part of the genetic engineering industry in the U.S. to begin to look at consumer-focused traits because they recognize that if this is to be a technology that consumers see more benefit to, not just see risks to, there has to be some apparent benefit to consumers. So we're beginning to see a focus on some nutritional traits and other kinds of traits that would be more clearly beneficial to consumers. So I hope in all that beating around the bush, I addressed your question somewhat. Okay. Thank you. Who has the next question? I'll bring the microphone, okay, Melissa. I've been asked to have you stand up so people can see you better. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, my question is about, you mentioned that there's been no reported instances of gene flow. Um, in the media, sometimes we hear about lawsuits between farmers that claim that you know, their crop was polluted. Um, mm -hmm. What, what mm -hmm. happened in that situation? Can you inform us? Yes, thank you. That's a good question. It's probably a subtlety I needed to be more clear about. So, as I said, the, the primary genetically engineered crop we have that cross-pollinates in this country is corn. What it cross-pollinates with is corn, okay? That becomes a problem if you are, for example, an organic corn farmer, and the person next to you is growing genetically engineered corn. Cross-pollination can happen, okay? There is a lot of talk on the web or in other venues, you see it in the news sometimes, about contamination of organic crops by genetically engineered corn. Just as a sidelight, one of my breeding projects is breeding corn for organics that will be less susceptible to that contamination. We can talk about that another time. It's a really fun genetic system that will help minimize that. But at any rate, um, part of the organic standard, what's, what's codified in the USDA's organic standard for certification of organic crops, is that you must produce your crop from a variety that was not genetically engineered and take reasonable measures to avoid contamination. This is essentially exactly the same thing as it says about pesticides. You must produce your crop without synthetic pesticides and take reasonable measures to avoid drift from your neighbors. Okay? It does not say if we test your crop and find genetically engineered content there, it will be rejected. Okay? So I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about that. Clearly organic farmers are concerned and they have reason to be concerned because cross-pollination in the world of corn does occur. But on the other hand, I am not aware of a single case where a farmer's crop could not be marketed because of that. For the most part, you know, if you if you went and planted your non-genetically engineered corn right downwind of a neighbor who you knew was planting genetically engineered corn with no buffer and you know same flowering date, you would not get certification because you didn't take any reasonable measures. That may have happened, I don't know. But for a farmer that took reasonable measures, talked to their neighbors, figured it out, put in their buffers, I am not aware of any case where their farm was decertified, those are some of the claims you hear, or where their crop could not be marketed as organic. The extent of cross-pollination is usually fairly limited. If you've ever been in a cornfield at flowering time, there is ooh gobs of pollen falling out of those tassels. So most of what pollinates any field is what's coming from that field. Does stuff blow in? Absolutely. But the frequency is going to be relatively low on a field scale. If you harvest right along the edge, you'll probably get more, right? So there's, that's, that's one answer. The other answer, and I think this is also where a lot of the concern comes from, there are certainly farmers in the world of corn who select and save their own seed. Those folks are very unhappy because most of them are located in places like the Corn Belt. And cross-pollination happens. So many of them have found that their seed that they've been saving and selecting now has genetically engineered traits in it. So that is true. And that one is very, very hard to manage. You can debate whether the onus should be on the organic farmer to avoid what his neighbor is doing or her neighbor. The precedent is there with the synthetic pesticides. You know, that's the way that one was set up. And I guess we chose to follow that precedent with genetically engineered crop content. I focused on corn because that's the major cross-pollinated crop. 
Soybeans, largely self-pollinating. Cotton, largely self-pollinating. So there's a too long an answer. Next question. Just raise your hand so I can see you. Back here in the corner. All right. Stand up straight. Okay. Yes, I'd like to also thank you for your excellent presentation. I had a question. I'm a Vermont resident, so we do have the legislature pass the labeling law. Mm -hmm. um, my concern is, you know, how do you, um, how, you can't test for that. You mentioned the corn syrup and things like mm -hmm. that. And, and I have the same concerns, I mean, with, with organic, we can't test and, and know mm -hmm. that a product is organic or non-organic it, because it's just a processing mm -hmm. of, of making that food. You know, how do you, how do you, regulate or how, I mean I, I, that's the concern I have is how do you know how do you verify yeah I think like with the organic situation the way that will have to work for most products that are derived from genetically engineered refined products derived from genetically engineered crops is you'll essentially have to have a chain of custody you know it, it, it has to be the identity has to be maintained from the sale of the seed right through to the presence of the crop, the product on the grocery store shelf. Because otherwise, you really have nothing to fall back on. If what you've got is a bag of soybeans, you know, you're selling whole soybeans, you can test them. So, so those whole foods, yes, you can test. But once you're down to where most of these things show up in our food system, which is refined ingredients, you really can't. And what you have to fall back on is um, records and certification along from planting, harvesting, shipping, into the processing, into the food manufacturing, into the warehouse, onto the grocery store shelf to know the origin of that product. That's really where I think the expense will come in. You know, people talk about, people argue about whether labeling is going to have a cost and how much that cost will be. I'm not sure how much it will be, but I am sure that the bigger piece of the expense is not adding a little thing on the label, right? Companies redesign their labels fairly often, but rather it's that retaining the identity and, and keeping that identity all the way through the product chain. That is done with organics. And so for people who are interested in purchasing things which they can be fairly sure do not have genetically engineered crop content, they can buy organic. There's also a GMO-free label that is being used now. So there are a couple alternatives, but actual the the labeling thing is going to be a challenge i'm i'm watching vermont i'll be interested to see how it gets implemented and i'll be very interested to see what the the many people who send food products into vermont choose to do you know will they just stop sending them will they label them all and not worry about it will they i don't know what they'll do it'll be interesting to see next question over here okay Thank you for your uh, very informed. Uh, you, you uh, correct me if I'm wrong. When you say ra Roundup ready corn, mm -hmm. it's resistant to Roundup, right? The corn itself. Yeah. So <coughs> it's not the corn I should worry. It, 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 this then they spray it with Roundup, and mm -hmm. these, the mm -hmm. corn fields are covered in Roundup. Mm -hmm. Who's taking care of the hedgerows? And um, I mean, where does this go? I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a. Is somebody watching the hedgerows? <coughs> where this stuff goes? Where the roundup ultimately yeah. ends up? Yeah. yeah, that's a that's a good question. And I guess I would say that's a that's a question about that would pertain not just to roundup but to any of the herbicides we use in agricultural systems. Okay, so you could ask that same question about every other herbicide that gets sprayed that happens to be selective. Atrazine, you know, atrazine kills a lot of broadleafs. It doesn't kill corn. What about the hedgerows? So I, I see it as, n as a question that's important, but not strictly only relevant to genetically engineered crops. Roundup, uh, I'm, I'll do the disclaimer now. I'm not a weed scientist and, and you know, kind of a lousy chemist, but my understanding of Roundup is that it's one of those herbicides that's broken down relatively quickly in the environment compared to others. And the breakdown products are things that people have found to be relatively innocuous in the environment. Uh, 
So I think if the concern is drift or if there's drift into the hedgerows, the hedgerows are going to be dying, okay? If it's just breakdown products and then their movement with soil or water, the breakdown products appear to be fairly innocuous. So I guess that's about, like I say, that's about all I can say as a corn breeder who's definitely not a herbicide person or a weed scientist. Sorry, I can't be too much more helpful on that one. Another question? <clears throat> I'm going to do this one first only because I'm closer, but I'll do you next. I guess he doesn't want to ask yours. <laughs> Two quick questions, or one. I noticed with your uh, your graph of areas, Europe mm -hmm. was very underrepresented. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that's because of the process labeling law that they have there, mm -hmm. or? And my second question is, why not wheat? Why hasn't wheat been developed as f for for this? Yeah, those are both good questions. Um, so Europe and genetically engineered crops, I think their um, concern about genetically engineered crops predates the process labeling. I think that emerged from their concern. That was one response to that concern. And I think Europe tends, I mean, for one thing, it's, it's the European Union, so they have to find agreement among a whole array of different countries. You know, we can't even find agreement within one country on most things, so I don't know how they find agreement among a whole group of countries in the EU. So part of the slow movement forward is that I think the negotiations and the arrival at agreement is a much more complex process. I would also say two other things that are, you know, again, this is reaching way beyond my expertise as a corn breeder, but I think the Europeans have a history that has included a few major food safety scares and much more scary ones than we have dealt with here. And I think that makes them much less inclined to trust food safety organizations, governmental organizations, and much more hesitant to move into anything that could have a risk. So I think that's a part of the history. Also, I would say in general, Europeans have a more kind of intimate cultural relationship with their food. This may not be every country. You know, I'm not sure the British have such an intimate cultural relationship with their food as some other places, but they tend to pay more attention to it. It's a more local affair. So I think all of those things together have made them move much more slowly. The other piece, you know, that graph that I showed with what, what are the major producers, it's obviously compounded by who has the most acreage of crop to begin with. So I showed only countries that had more than a million hectares of genetically engineered crop. Well, if you're Belgium, you know, you may not even have a million hectares of crops, period, right? So some of the smaller European countries may just not show up there at all because of small acreages. Most of those countries are not planting much, if any, okay? So there's a bunch of musings on Europe. And now that I said all that, I completely forgot what the next question was. Could you remind me? Oh, wheat. Yes, thank you. So genetically engineered wheat, some of them were developed, and particularly um, glyphosate-resistant or Roundup-resistant wheat was developed. Um, there was a push to get it approved probably about, I'm going to say, eight or ten years ago. That was, um, that was being developed and tested somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, at that time, the... Um, wheat marketing boards in Canada and the U.S., as well as a number of the wheat growers' organizations, said, whoa, we don't want this, okay? And they said that because wheat is a highly traded commodity crop. There were some major markets that were very hesitant to accept genetically engineered crops. And wheat is something, you know, I, I think a piece of it is, we know we eat wheat. We don't think of ourselves eating field corn. We don't think of ourselves as eating much soybeans. We certainly don't think of ourselves as eating cotton, but we know we eat wheat. So I think it kind of the, the ante was up in terms of it being something we obviously eat in flour and bread and pastries and a whole pasta, a whole array of things. A number of markets that were hesitant about accepting genetically engineered crops, if not flat out refusing to accept them, that were important global wheat markets. And the wheat, the, the, this immense international trade in wheat, 
has operated very smoothly because they can simply say there are no genetically engineered varieties, so there's no concern about it. Once the first one comes along, whenever that may be, if it does, that will complicate that marketing very dramatically. So at that time, the, the, a fair share of the growers as well as the marketers did not want it, so it was dropped. Will it come back? I'm, you know, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Excuse me. You had the question, right? Yeah. Just be sure to stand up. So. My question is probably different than the others. <clears throat> yeah. Hybrid, like hybrid corn. Mm -hmm. How guaranteed is it for if you grow hybrid corn to take the seed off the corn you grow to grow it yourself? That's a good question. I love that question because this is what I do. <laughs> so you can save seed from a hybrid corn and you can plant it and you can grow it and it will grow. The trouble is it will not be anywhere near as good a corn as the hybrid you first purchased. Yeah, that's exactly right. It will probably yield somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 60 percent of what the original hybrid did. And in sh the very short answer as to why, because I mean, I'm an, I'm an educator, I can't not tell you why, right? So the short answer as to why is that when you make a hybrid, you create a lot of specific gene combinations. When you save the seed off it, you've essentially inbred. Inbreeding, it's like what happened in the British royal family. They all married each other and you ended up with hemophiliacs and insane people and a bunch of other weird things, okay? <laughs> so that's basically, what happens in the corn, <laughs> the hemophiliacs and the insane plants and the weirdos. So when you inbreed, you lose vigor in corn. And that's why when you save seed, it, in the hybrid, every plant is genetically identical to every one, but they have lots of different genes in them. When you inbreed them, they that start to look bad. That goes for hybrid, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for a very interesting and very clear presentation. Um, I, aside from coming to the Minor Institute to hear talks like yours, um, you've, you've shown in the presentation that there's a lot of misinformation, a lot of misimpressions in the general public. And so uh, I'm wondering what you think um, can be done to help to educate the, the public and, and make them better aware of the, the kinds of issues that you've been discussing this evening? I wish I had a great answer to that question. Um, as I look at it, you know, I think about in my own busy life, you know, I, I feel well informed about genetic engineering, but it's because it's my profession. You know, how many other issues do I have sort of these concerns or things that nag at the back of my mind, but I don't have the time to really find out about them. You know, I'm just not going to have the time to completely delve in and fully understand. And I think that's where we all take those shortcuts of looking on the web, looking at a source that we think might think similarly to us and trusting everything it says. And I think that's a very, it's a, you know, the, the readiness of information and opinion right now is very much a two-edged sword in that regard. You can find any opinion you want. And I've had people sit there and tell me, well, I read it on the web, so it's true. You know, well, you, you can find anything on the web, and that doesn't mean it's true. So I guess I, you know, I advise people, this is not an answer to your question, but I advise people as they look at information to ask themselves, is this document or this website or this information I'm looking at, is everything it says about this only one side of the argument? Is everything negative or is everything positive? Either of those should raise alarm bells because there's nothing that has only positive or only negative dimensions, right? So those should raise alarm bells. I also try as I'm looking up information to look at university resources, resources where the, the entity putting them out does not have a dog in the game, a dog in the fight, you know, where they're, they're not going to benefit financially or some other obvious way 
from you believing what they said. Because there's a human tendency to only portray that which will benefit you, right? So those are some of the things I try to help people think about because I, I realize not, nobody, not everybody's going to take a course in genetics. You know, that's just not going to happen. So at some level, I honestly don't know. I think as with many technologies, in the fullness of time, people will become more comfortable with this one for better or worse. You know, we've become comfortable with a lot of other technologies, and some of them have panned out great, and some of them we've found out were not really so great, right? It's a history we have. We tend to be a society that embraces first and asks questions later on down the road, you know? I suspect ultimately that's what will happen with this, but I think the, the notion that everybody can become more educated about it is probably a pipe dream. People have to want to know first. I mean, you all came here for some reason, right? You, you're probably the curious portion about this particular subject. But for people who are not interested in learning more or have decided they already know what they think, there's very little anyone's going to do to alter that perspective. So that's kind of a depressing end. <laughs> Any other questions? Got to get to the front so I can look back. Okay, over here. I have to say, Margaret, in the back, somebody said that not everyone's going to take a course in genetics, and those that do, not everyone's going to pass either. So. <laughs> yeah, there is that issue as well. <laughs> this is kind of a question about what you'd said about the effects between 1996 and the use of herbicides on mm -hmm. plants mm -hmm. and the resistance, the increase in the resistance of plants. Mm -hmm. Like, what would the effect be? on public health, like if you could theorize on that in such a short period of time with the increase in one thing, if the plants show a resistance, then... Hmm. Okay, well, I'll, I'll see what I can say on that one. Um, I think the plants evolve resistance because they're the targets of that, what to them is a poison, right? So the Roundup uh, is generally toxic, it, it interrupts photosynthesis, so it's generally toxic to plants, okay? As with any other pest, if you try to use the same hammer on them over and over and over again, that hammer will gradually become ineffective. I think the effect on, on the human population, you know, generally, they're not exposed. Um, I think for we as humans over evolutionary time, you know, if somebody was poisoning us as a, as, a, as a species, we would have that same evolutionary potential to overcome the effect of a poison. But fortunately, that's not happening at a, you know, human species level. It doesn't mean that there wouldn't be lots of people that would die, but, you know, it takes time for resistance to evolve, and especially for a slow multiplying creature like us. You need to remember that weeds, you know, if there's one weed out of your field that happens to not be as, for, for whatever genetic mutation it has, isn't quite as susceptible to Roundup, where are the weed seeds next year going to have come from? The one weed that survived. And they're going to inherit that trait it had. So very rapidly, the weed population becomes largely derived from that one individual that was less susceptible, right? So, you know, do, do I see that having an impact on humans? Not particularly because we're not, you know, we're not being sprayed with Roundup. I don't see it happening. It also is something that is very non-toxic to mammals. I mean, the, 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 um, the natural biochemistry it targets is something that's present in plants but not in animals. So I, I'm not particularly concerned in that regard. Um, I think we have a, a much, the much bigger question is how do we manage how much glyphosate gets used on all these different glyphosate resistant crops? Because the more broadly we use it, the more problems we're going to see with the resistant weeds. So that's where I see the greater issue. Yeah. Okay. Another question or questions? Oh, behind me. Snack up. Hi. So, uh, given that the way that um, genetically engineered crops or seed lines are produced, is there a risk to biodiversity within um, seed lines because mm -hmm. of that? Mm -hmm. 
That's a really good question. <laughs> you get a star for using genetic engineering instead of GMOs. Um, I think the, um, a couple things to understand first. Um, people develop a genetically engineered trait like BT or like herbicide tolerance, and then they put it in many different varieties. So in that regard, there isn't a direct risk. It's, it's fairly efficient to cross it into different varieties within a zone of adaptation. So I think that happens, you know, the, the seed industry is developing new varieties. When they find ones that work, they stick in their genetically engineered traits and market them. And that development of new varieties, that pipeline is very similar to what it has been for the last 30 or 40 years. So is biodiversity going down dramatically? No, probably not, okay, in our cultivated crops. The one place, the one place where biodiversity is very restricted is that Roundup resistance gene or that BT gene. That is the same gene in every, a, a whole array. I shouldn't say every because there are different versions of BT and there are a few different versions of Roundup resistance. But you find many varieties that have exactly the same genetic sequence at that one place, that one gene. So there is relatively little diversity for that particular gene. How might that be a problem? Well, I date back, practically, <laughs> I do date back, unfortunately, to the 1970 epidemic of southern corn leaf blight. That was in 1970, for those of you who are not familiar with it, there was a situation where many of the corn varieties in the country, there were many, many, many different corn varieties, but they shared a particular gene that allowed more simple production of hybrids, okay? It just so happened that that same gene was one that the southern corn leaf blight organism could exploit. It exploited it or used that gene as part of its disease-causing process. When you spread that gene out over the whole environment, it's like the, the corollary to the herbicide thing we're just talking about, all of a sudden those southern corn leaf blights saw the cafeteria was open. So those variants of the organism that could take good advantage of that became very prevalent in the population and we had a massive epidemic in 1970 of southern corn leaf blight. Was it because anybody thought this was a gene for southern corn leaf blight resistance or susceptibility? No but it was something that was uniform across a huge share of the crop acreage. What's the chance that that kind of a scenario could happen with a genetically engineered trait? You know, it's really a complete guess. There was no understanding there was a linkage between those two traits at that time. It was kind of a serendipitous thing. Could it possibly happen? Yeah, probably. And is there diversity at that gene? Not much. Not much. So there is, there's that little risk, and I think it's an interesting one for us to watch out for, particularly as we build, for example, the same Roundup resistance gene into corn, soybeans, alfalfa, cotton, sugar beets, you know, a whole canola, a whole array of crops. That's creating a pretty big array of uniformity at a very small piece of the genetic material. Got a question back here. Pardon me. How much does crop rotation have to do with stopping of resistance of uh, herbicides and pesticides? Great question. Crop rotation is critical to that. So what, what you want to do in order to avoid evolution of resistance on the part of pests, be it diseases, weeds, insects, is use different control measures and break up the cycles. So as a, as a nice example, um, the Midwest for a long time, they have their corn-soybean rotation, right? Half of Iowa is planted to corn and the other half is planted to soybeans and next year they flip, right? So that rotation very effectively controlled the corn rootworm for many years because corn rootworms lay their eggs in corn and the next spring the larvae emerge and eat corn. They don't eat soybeans. So if what's in the field next is soybean, the larvae emerge and they die. Very effective pest control. Crop rotation can really help with the weed situation unless what you're rotating is Roundup-resistant soybeans and Roundup-resistant corn and you're spraying both of them with Roundup. 
you know, you need to rotate the actual herbicides you use, in that case, not just the crops. And you all will probably see this. So if you drive around and you see a soybean field, and the only thing in there, no weeds, but corn here and there, you know it was a person who planted Roundup-resistant corn the last season, and those are the volunteers, and the Roundup did not kill them. So you need to, you need to rotate crops for a whole array of reasons, soil health, pest cycle breaking up, reducing pest pressure, a whole range of things. But you also need to rotate the chemicals you use to control those weeds, okay? Great. Any other questions? Second look. Okay. Yeah, why not? I'm looking at the <laughs> clock. This is going to be a great question, but I'll, I'll give you the evil eye. eye no more. Well, percent. my my sister's. And we were talking about this earlier today. I so said I'm coming to this. And what she's worried about is if she eats the GMO products, she's worried about a risk to her in the future or the buildup of whatever is in them that might affect health. And why shouldn't she just avoid them as much as she can so she doesn't have that risk? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the kind of thing that a lot of people are concerned about. The thing to remember is when you eat a genetic, a, a product derived from a genetically engineered crop, first, all of those refined products, there's nothing different about them. So if what she's eating is, you know, I don't know, ketchup. Right? The corn syrup in there is the same no matter what it came from, it's just corn syrup. On the, on the other side, um, we consume DNA and proteins in vast quantities every day in many, many, many different foods. Our digestive system breaks those down. It breaks down the proteins into their constituents, which are amino acids. There are only 21 of them. Every protein that exists is made of some mix of those 21 amino acids. So your digestive system breaks those down into their constituent amino acids. Any, any other protein that comes in there is going to be broken down into those same, one or another, those same 21 amino acids. The place, where, and you know, you should be saying, well, what about allergens? Because what I said makes it sound like there should not be. So that, that is a result of usually a protein, a given protein, that is not broken down very quickly in the gut. It remains there longer and causes in certain people a bad reaction before that breakdown process can happen. So that's, that's part of why there is careful testing of the potential for any of these proteins to be allergenic. And what they actually do is take the new protein and test it in a petri dish with human digestive enzymes and measure how long it takes to break down. And if it takes any longer than sort of standard proteins would take, that raises a red flag for exactly the reason I just talked to you about. So these proteins and this DNA, it's not like it's building up somehow. Your digestive system is meant to break those things down. You then absorb them as small molecules and your body builds the things you need out of it. There are certainly, you know, toxins that can build up. We, you know, we had that experience with certain pesticides. Those are different kinds of molecules. They're not proteins and they're not DNA. And they are not effectively broken down in the digestive system, okay? So it's, it gets into fairly complicated food and digestive chemistry, mm -hmm. which, you know, again, I'm no expert in it and I'm sure not gonna go take a course in it now. <laughs> and yet, you know, it, it sounds scary to a lot of people and I understand that, I completely understand that. Okay. One final question from anybody? I say you it that way, probably no one that, wants to be know? the last <laughs> one. Yeah. I thought that was well, one final question there, Rick. Okay. <laughs> no. It was a no, good I'm kidding one. You. I'm kidding you. Looking at the, at the clock, you've done yeoman's work, Margaret. And so yeah, well, let's thank so her one more time for an excellent presentation. <laughs>